So it's been a while, like over a year since the last Trails character analysis, but we are finally back. And this time we're dissecting another Enforcer, meaning we're also back to talking about tarot archetypes. And don't worry, I'll briefly explain all the relevant Jungian concepts before diving into the meat of this video. So without further ado, it's time to analyze Ouroboros Enforcer 2, Luve, the Blade Lord. BT Dubs, isn't it shocking that I'm finally saying his name right? First off, we need to cover what a tarot archetype is and how it pertains to Swiss psychologist Carl Jung and his followers' ideas. So, Jung was one of the founding members of analytical psychology and advanced this concept known as the collective unconscious. This collective unconscious is the foundation of society's ideas about human narratives, or in other words, the different types of people we encounter in our lives. For example, practically each one of us has met a motherly figure at some point in our life's journey. This kind of figure repeats itself over and over in the shows and movies we watch, the books we read, and the video games we play. So think of an archetype as basically a trope from TV tropes. Now the thing that connects these tarot archetypes across all cultures within human civilization is the overall relationship that remains the same between an individual and any one of the archetypal figures. Like when it comes to the motherly figure, we see this kind of person as caring, loving, and nurturing. And I do just want to point out that I'm not an actual tarot card reader since I am a spiritual person who's beholden to a different religion already. I just enjoy analyzing the tarot from the more psychological lens of Jung's ideas. Now, there's one last Jungian concept I'd like to define before we move on, and that's the anima and animus. In their most basic form, anima refers to the traits we traditionally associate with masculinity, while the animus refers to those which we associate with femininity. But diving into Jung's theory a bit more, we find that the anima is the unconscious feminine side in men, while the animus is the unconscious masculine part of a woman. Any one person can become a more fulfilled version of themselves if they find a balance between the anima and animus. For example, a traditional male can better develop his empathy, a normally feminine trait, if he finds balance with his animus. So now that we've covered the necessary Jungian background, let's dive into the High Priestess symbolism found in Luve's character. Just want to let you guys know that I'll be using a lot of the Luve Monogatari manga in this video since it offers some great insight into his mindset during the events in Sky as well as some more behind-the-scenes stuff for Richard and Ouroboros in general. I highly recommend giving it a read, courtesy of Soshi's translation. Link can be found in the description. So, as an archetype, it's the priestess's job to mediate between the spiritual and otherwise unknown unconscious realm. This is in contrast to the Magician Arcana and its ability to materialize these spiritual forces into the real world. You see, the Magician represents the masculine or anima energy, while the Priestess represents the animus or the feminine. This is what makes Luve such a fascinating representation of the Priestess archetype, since unlike all the other series that make use of the Major Arcana, Luve is the only male character to represent the High Priestess, or at least the only one I know of. So taking a deeper look at Luve, we see that he exhibits quite a few traits that are typically regarded as more feminine in nature. For one, he actually looks out for the younger members of Ouroboros, Joshua and Ren. He keeps the younger girl company whenever she's around and just treats her gently overall. And as for Joshua, Luve's always been looking out for him, 
even before Hommel's demise. And fast forwarding to the early events in SC, Liu Fei is seen wishing for Joshua's happiness and hopes he never returns to Ouroboros. In other words, Liu Fei was basically a mom to these kiddos and raised them as it intuitively came to him. Unlike the other enforcers who keep to themselves more or less, Liu Fei trained the younger enforcer Joshua, as well as the jester Jaegers later on. He is clearly the most nurturing and motherly, if you'll allow me to describe him as that, of all the enforcers. He's quite compassionate and was training to be a bracer before tragedy struck in his life after all. These traits are contrasted with the counterpart of the Priestess Arcana, the Magician and the Anima. McBurn couldn't care less about the other society members, and focused on doing his own thing throughout the Cold Steel arc, as can be seen in his interactions with Dubes, for instance. Speaking of the Magician and Priestess Arcanas, their duality is further symbolized in how McBurn and Luve were the only two enforcers to be gifted a weapon forged via the Divergent Laws. But going back to the feminine energy of the Priestess, in Jungian terms, compassion or empathy would fall on the feminine side of things, which I think is showcased in Luve's care towards human lives. He never brushes off the loss of a life, even those of the Jester Jaegers and reminds Ren not to kill indiscriminately. And then there's his visit to Ravenu Village to pay tribute to all those who perished 10 years ago. But the most notable trait of the High Priestess archetype is her knowledge of the mysterious, spiritual, and unconscious realm. And so, taking a look at Sky FC, Falcom really plays up the mystery behind Lawrence Belgar and how no one seems to have any information on him. Though in contrast, Luve always knows a whole lot about our party members. Not only this, but Luve knows the truth about the Hommel tragedy, which is something that's entirely unknown and top secret except to a select few within the entire continent. He also speaks in metaphors that deal with things that are beyond what's merely found in our earthly realm, like how he brings up the heavens when addressing Chloe, or the moon when speaking to Ren. All these things contribute to this narrative that Luve has this profound, almost mystical knowledge. But of course, the second arcana doesn't just stop there. The High Priestess also helps others look beyond the surface in order to understand truths that appear shrouded by mystery upon first glance. Luve plays this role for a number of characters, like how he literally guides Colonel Richard to the miraculous power beneath Gransel Castle. But there's no bigger example of this guidance than in his interactions with Agate Crossner. You see, the Priestess archetype is characterized by incredible intuition, which Luve demonstrates towards Agate after exchanging only a few blows. He easily sees past Agate's anger and fury, and knows that he's actually just an emotionally broken man due to past trauma. Agate is still angry with himself for his inability to protect his sister all those years ago, just as Luve was when it came to Karen. The latter's inner thoughts confirm as much, which is why he's so successful in understanding Agate. Luve's words continuously warn the Heavy Blade that continuing to stew in anger will only bring serious harm to himself and others, like how Agate's fury caused him to rashly charge in all on his own, an act that would have gotten him killed if Tita hadn't shown up in time. But despite Agate nearly dying at the hands of Luve, the Bracer never would have confronted his past hurts nor grown in maturity if it wasn't for that encounter. So even though it was Tita who had the real heart-to-heart -heart with Agate, this couldn't have happened without that near fight to the death with Luve guiding it all. It's also thanks to Luve that Joshua met Estelle, the now love of his life, via joining the society where he'd received the mission to assassinate Cassius. 
Speaking of joining Ouroboros, no analysis of the Blade Lord is complete without addressing his disillusionment with society. So due to the horrific inside job and bloody slaughter of Hamel, Luve lost completely everything. His love Karen died while protecting her brother Joshua, the latter who was now essentially comatose with PTSD. After witnessing the sheer evil that humanity is capable of, Luve made it his mission to wake society up. Or in other words, to expose how fragile our everyday lives are in the face of events and forces out of our control. As expected of the upright Priestess Arcana, he sheds light on an unconscious truth. How everyday people like you and me have grown content with our peaceful existence, while events like Hamel are planned and even executed as we speak. Luffy is not wrong in those points, and it's interesting to see the compassionate animus of the priestess balanced with the anima here. While he's attempting to use the forceful method, or more masculine way of doing things, via using the aureole to wake up humanity, he's not doing it out of any real malice towards others. But it's also in Luve's monologue that we see how he embodies the reverse aspects of the priestess archetype. So the priestess always has keen intuition or gut feelings, right? Even without having actual evidence, like how Luve could see right through Chloe and Agate's struggles, as well as Weizmann and his involvement in the Hamel incident. But at the end of the day, Luve's just been deluding himself into thinking people are completely powerless. Joshua says it himself, Luve knows that Karen made a choice to save him, and that's why Joshua can have the happy life he has with Estelle and his friends today. The Blade Lord choosing to discard what he knows to be true is also highlighted in how he knows staying with the society is bad in the long run which is why he hopes Joshua never returns, yet he brushes off that same idea when it regards himself. This wake-up call from Joshua is exactly what Luve needed though to accept the truth he knew deep down all along. He makes the decision to leave the society and join Joshua and his friends when tragedy strikes one more time. With the otherworldly power that only the magician and priestess possess, Luve uses the Kernvider to give everyone the opening they need to stop Wiseman, though sadly at the cost of his own life. Even so, people are not powerless. It was Luve's decision to save us, and he was able to die happily, just as Karen had, knowing that Joshua was safe with the Brights now. Which is why it's so fitting that Cassius, with Ragnar's help, was the one who saved Joshua and Estelle from falling to their deaths. And finally, at long last, Luve was laid to rest with Karen, so that the two of their spirits could watch over everyone together forever. And that's a wrap, guys. Luve's done so many great things for the other characters, so I'd like to hear what Luve moment stood out to you most. Also, giving this video a like if you liked it would really help me out. Be sure to join the Discord and follow me on Twitter and Twitch if you like. I stream about four days a week. And finally, I'd like to thank all my patrons, especially Jared Breland, Andreas Hansen, Captain Hobo, NT Luck and Big Clingy for all their support. Seriously, can't do it without you guys. So keep a lookout for the next Trails character poll, and until next time, take care. See ya!